Welcome to our review on blood and body defense mechanisms. So the first thing that we're going to consider here is how our body is going to defend itself against the invasion of various pathogens in the eventuality that you've managed to cut yourself. So when you cut yourself, hopefully you've noticed the fact that you then start to bleed. So blood is leaking out of your body. The reason for that is that you've damaged that physical barrier that keeps everything inside separate from everything outside. So once your skin has been cut and starts to bleed, then what we find is in our blood, we've got these little fragments of cells called platelets, and they are going to change a protein in the blood called fibrinogen into fibrin. Now those fibrins, fibers actually form a network in the cut itself. So we're making a mesh basically. And what happens then is as that red blood cell tries to pass through, it gets trapped in the mesh of those fibers and we end up with a blood clot. So as the clot hardens, we end up with a scab over the surface of that cut, which means that we won't be able to get any pathogens into the wound because we've got basically like a hard shell over the surface. So underneath your skin cells will then replace themselves by repair. And then what we find is that once that's all occurred, the scab falls off. In addition to your body's ability to form scabs to then create a new physical barrier, we have a range of other non-specific responses that prevent the entry of all microorganisms. So first one is the good old skin, which is that physical barrier so your skin is made up of dry dead cells and that makes it very hard for microbes to get through. You've also got sweat glands in your skin itself and those produce oils that actually help to kill microorganisms on the surface. If we go inside the body in your stomach, you've got stomach acid and the whole idea behind that is to kill any pathogens present in contaminated food and drink, assuming they're in low enough quantities. If we go to the airways next, you've got the cilia, which are the tiny hair-like structures and mucus within the airways there. The mucus will trap the microorganisms and then the cilia have that little wafting motion where they basically have a little wave and that moves the mucus up to the top of the throat where it's then swallowed into the stomach acid, bacteria and pathogens are killed. Inside your nose, you've got hairs. So you've got the nasal hairs there whole idea behind that is to keep dust and microorganisms from getting into the airways in the first place. And then in your eyes, you do have tears and they contain lysozymes, which are there to destroy the bacteria that come into contact with the surface of your eye as well. Obviously, those defenses to keep the microorganisms out of the body in the first place aren't always successful. So even if that initial defense mechanism fails, we do still have our white blood cells. Now, we've got two types of white blood cell that we need to remember the names of, phagocytes and lymphocytes. So in the blood smear at the bottom, what we can see is on the right, we have a phagocyte, which you can see with that multiple nucleus there. And on the left, you've got the lymphocyte with that very large singular nucleus. The two white blood cells actually carry out different functions within our immune system. The phagocytes, first of all, carry out a process conveniently called phagocytosis. So phagocytes carry out phagocytosis, which basically means that they engulf and digest any microorganisms. So you can see in the picture at the bottom, your pathogens, the little kind of red rod shaped bits, our white blood cell or our phagocyte is the blob in the middle in blue. So the first thing they do is they actually expand out and then engulf so they surround the pathogen then enzymes come in they break down the pathogen itself and just release the waste products so it's engulfing and digesting the second type of white blood cell we need to know about are the lymphocytes and these actually produce one of two types of chemical either antibodies or antitoxins the key thing to remember here is that on the surface of our pathogen on the right there, we've got these little protein spikes called antigens, and they have a specific shape that will correspond to the antibody on our lymphocyte. So the antibodies produced by the lymphocyte are specific to a particular antigen. 
When we're referring to an antibody, what we're referring to is a protein that's produced by our lymphocyte, which will bind to antigens on the surface of the microorganism. This process is important because once that's occurred, the pathogen can then be ingested by a phagocyte. So what we've got here is an example of a specific form of defense. Because those antibodies are specific to a particular antigen on the surface of the pathogen, then we have a specific form of defense. It only works with certain ones. After you've actually been infected with a pathogen and your body's made those antibodies to it, then what we actually find is that the body retains some white blood cells as memory cells. So that this means that if that same pathogen was to infect you a second time, your body would be able to respond faster, eliminating that pathogen before you show symptoms because some of those white blood cells that are able to make that specific antibody remain in circulation in your blood. And this is immunity. So when we refer to you being immune to something, it just means that you've got some of these memory cells in your body that are able to make the antibodies to a particular pathogen much quicker than if you hadn't got those memory cells. So you can eliminate the pathogen before you show any symptoms. Hopefully at the end of this video, you can now state some examples of non-specific body defense mechanisms. You can describe the role of platelets in the defense against disease by explaining how scabs form. And you can describe the role of the white blood cells in the body, remembering the two types and what they actually do.